Welcome to the Fit and Free with AIM podcast. I'm your host, Amy Louise. By listening to this podcast, you'll gain clarity and apply now principles in relation to training, nutrition, and mindset, all designed to help you build a strong and lean physique and show up as your best self. If you're a woman who struggles with excessive behaviors when it comes to training and food and think of yourself as a perfectionist, I hear you, I see you, I was you. And I know that you're in exactly the right place to change that narrative and build a body you love inside and out. Let's go. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. So I put up a poll on my Instagram to get an idea of what you guys wanted to hear for this week's episode. And the most popular option was the 1% is for training performance. And before we dive in, I think there are a few things that I would like to say. So first of all, as always, if there's anything in this episode that you love or resonate with you, absolutely shoot me through a DM. I'd love to hear from you. But also don't forget to tag me in your stories if you listen. If you listen, I really, really appreciate that support. But also helping to get the podcast out in front of more women who could benefit from all of the information that uh, I am able to provide through this platform. So thank you so much for joining me. The disclaimer that I need to make with this one is, of course, there are times where looking for like, you know, that 1% extra is just not what you need right now. So I just want to say if you're if you're struggling a little bit and you listen to this, I hope it doesn't make you feel overwhelmed or like, oh my God, there are so many little things to do and I feel so far behind. Now, there was a definite, or there have been so many times where this has been me And I've been saying to a lot of my clients recently that we've just got to go with the ebbs and flows, okay? So there are going to be phases where everything, all of our ducks are in a row and everything feels fantastic. And I think this is where if we've got this information, we can make the most out of that phase that we're in. And there are going to be other times, whether it's due to stress, illness, or injury, where some of these things won't be what you need right now, and that's also okay. So I just want to make sure you understand, because that's, this is not like a beginner or intermediate thing. This is just like different phases of life are happening. And you know, I'm almost seven years into coaching now. I'm going to be seven years in like the 1st of September or around there. And this means that I have had clients from the get-go. I've been coaching some of my clients for seven years, which is insane. But what that has seen is so many women going through so many different phases. So there have been job changes, location changes, pregnancies. There have been relationship changes, diagnosis. There have been a lot of things that have happened to a lot of my clients and and even myself, just watching myself go through different phases. So this episode will either be educational for you. If you're not in a place to be able to execute on this, please don't see it as anything uh, pressuring or overwhelming, more like uh, some education to support you in future when and if all your ducks are in a row and you can execute. But also there might be some little things in here that you still can do that will assist with your training performance, even in one of those phases where it's a little bit of a, a dip or, you know, like an un optimal or unideal phase of your life, maybe even out of your control right now. Or maybe you're in a position like I am at the moment. I've got to be honest with you. I am fucking riding the wave that I am on. I have had a solid eight months now of honestly really close to almost perfect consistency. And I am riding that wave because like I just said to you, (laughs) I've not had this uh, really ever, to be fair with you. I've always had roadblocks that have come up and that's roughly over about yeah about eight years of training so I started training consistently about 12 months before I became a personal trainer and so we're looking at about um, eight years of training and in that this is the best eighth month block I've ever had there has always been something that has come up previously right so you bet I'm riding this wave because we just never know when these waves are going to finish there is inevitably something that's going to happen, uh, you know, touch wood, uh, but it can be anything, right, that gets in the way of our ability to give 100%, and this is normal. 
And this is another thing that I should really stress to my clients. It's normal to have ebbs and flows. This is just human. And when we have the education behind us, I think we're really well equipped to be able to use our dial system and the way we approach our training and nutrition is by looking at it with a dial. That's how we make this sustainable. And we're able to turn it up or down according to whichever life phase we're in. But if we're like completely able to both mentally and physically push, I say, why the fuck not? And yeah, like I was saying, having this education behind us helps us know exactly which areas to push in. And I'm, yeah, super, super pumped to get into this episode because I do think it is going to help you level up your training. And this has definitely been something that's on my mind recently. I've been doing lots of study about really looking at what are the one percenters for people who training isn't their livelihood? Okay. So a lot of, must admit that a lot of people that I look up to are in the bodybuilding community, which is divorced from, can I just say it's divorced from health? There, there's, um, you know, bodybuilding is not about health. I know for some people they might see the physiques and think it's like the epitome of health. It's not. Their specific goal is an aesthetic look and it's not health. And <laughs> Their goal, their main overarching goal is not to achieve um, the greatest amount of health. I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. I just wanted to take a quick break to let you know how you can work with me. I currently have places available inside the Glam Body Program. And if you don't know what it is, this is my completely personalized programming, nutrition, and education online coaching service that is specifically designed to help women get strong and progress their body composition, whether that means gaining muscle, getting lean, or both. So Glam Body is best suited for two types of women. The first loves training, but you've never had a your programming or nutrition tailored to you. Perhaps you're just doing classes or using apps but you do want more efficient results and you want to learn more about your body or perhaps you have had some element of assistance before but you're still struggling with overtraining under eating speaking negatively to yourself and you feel like nothing's enough and you just want to be able to make physique and performance progress without burning the candle at both ends so to get your spot just dm me on instagram with the heading glam body or you can fill out the application form that is linked in the show notes below and we can have a chat about whether Glam Body is a good fit for you. With that said, let's get back into the episode. But in terms of at least the the outcomes that I'm personally looking for, which is muscle growth, these people are, you know, there's definitely some things that they don't do well and where some education and some more science-based approaches I think do serve them better but there are some people who have been really able to merge like the bro and the science together to get the best and those are the those are the people in the industry and they're typically the coaches um there are some athletes as well but um actually the one I'm thinking of is is a coach and athlete like he's both Um, but yeah, they've been really able to get the best out of both of those worlds and put them together. And I think that we can learn something out of that. And I say we, because I'm a hobby lifter. I do this for fun. I do this with the overarching desire of being as mobile for as long as possible, as functional for as long as possible and doing what I can in terms of mitigating health risks. I'm not completely anal about it. You're not going to see me doing things like, you know, I don't know, not using a microwave or, you know, not wearing a mask in cities, like fucking whatever. You know, I'm not that anal that I'm going to be worried about those sorts of things. It's a choice. and We all do. We all choose how we live our lives. And, you know, I'm going to be as much as people might not like to do this, I'm going to be eating, eating out of plastic containers and stuff like that. Like it's just not the extent that I choose to worry about things. Um, and I appreciate that we're all different with that, but I still think, yeah, going through these one percenters, these aren't overly complicated, but they are going to really help you get the most out of your training. So what have I got? I've got six main points that I'm going to go through in this episode. Okay. So I'm going to look at our overall objective for our training performance. I'm going to break this up into pre, during, and post training. And then I'm going to go through each one of those individually and 
indicate to you the factors that I'm looking at or the components of each of those phases that I'm looking at when I'm thinking of improving uh, my training performance, okay? And so it might be helpful if you're listening to this to get out a bit of a pen and paper. This is going to be one of those episodes, I think, where you can jot down some notes and write down like what uh, we're looking at for each of these phases, but then also maybe highlighting the things that feel achievable to you. And I think that that's the, that's the overarching point of this podcast that I want to get across is like there are all of these really cool things that we can tinker with and you may just want to you know pick one or two here and there to start working on and see if you can implement that into a routine that works for you. It's absolutely not a, like you must do any of all of these things to get amazing results. That's not not how I think of training anyway. I really think of training as it's an ongoing practice of a skill. And I also, for me, it provides enjoyment. Uh, I get a little bit of competition even against myself just do, you know with week to week progression seeing what I can do and I know it's not always guaranteed which kind of makes it fun for me maybe that's a little bit is it masoch- masochistic <laughs> but I'm not sure if that's the right word <laughs> but that's that's where I find the fun so let us dive in all right when we're thinking of the one percenters for our training performance we're really th- we really need to start with What is the overall goal that we're trying to achieve when we're going into the gym? Now, again, (laughs) I'm very, I'm specifically talking to the kinds of people who are A, listening to my podcast and B, have, have an interest in looking at the one percenters. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say, if you're listening and you're specifically listening to this episode, you're probably going to want to see muscle mass progression or strength progression, or like technique, skill progression, and or a combination of all three, okay? So when you, I believe, are going into the gym, if you were to take a step back and look at it in a macro level, you're trying to progress one or all three of those things, skills, muscle mass, and strength. And we know we've got to repeat things over and over and over again in order to get those outcomes, so then if we're thinking of if we're thinking of those three goals together, what we need to have at the forefront of our mind as the purpose of literally like every single rep that we're doing in the gym, for us, for these goals specifically, it's going to be the quality of every rep you perform and the intensity of every rep you perform. And the word intensity is something that I think people get confused with. When I speak on intensity, I am talking about two things. So intensity, when you are typically reading it in relation to lifting, it is going to relate to the percentage of a hypothetical 1RM for that movement. Okay, so just say your one rep max, that's what I mean by RM, your one rep max is what you could lift for one rep at 100% intensity. So you can only really do it once, right? And then as we pull back from there, it might be, you know, 85%, 75%, 50%, whatever, okay? This does, intensity does differ to the word effort, but please excuse me, I am going to use them fairly interchangeably um, throughout the podcast episode, but they are different. So when we're talking about effort, and this is very, so intensity is, I would say, is specific to both strength and hypertrophy, but for hypertrophy, we are more so looking at, or no, not more so, we are as well looking at uh, how close are you lifting to failure. It is a critical principle for hypertrophy, for muscle growth that is, which is how close are we training to failure. And I think I am going to do a separate episode on this because there are quite a lot of nuances But when we're thinking of muscle growth, we are going to need to be training within zero or three reps of failing that movement. And you can say, you know, is it technical failure, which is the the form breaks down or is it 
concentric mechanical failure, which is where you like literally cannot move another rep. And ideally, we're going to be hitting the spot with both. So ideally, your form and your ability to skillfully perform the movement is going to be so good that it's not your skill that breaks down first, even though you could physically do another rep, it's that you are training with amazing form and it's your it's the mechanical breakdown that you actually can't move the rep through that nice that that really nice form anymore. And I think when those two things go hand in hand, we're going to be a very skilled, we're probably going to be more towards that advanced lifter. So I still classify myself as more of an intermediate lifter because I don't actually believe yet that I have mastered the skill of training, you know, within one rep really of failure across everything. I think my mind gets in the way and which is really easy to do because it is so uncomfortable to truly train to failure. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of psychological effort. It takes a lot of bandwidth. And I don't want to insult anyone, but if you're listening to this, it's probably actually highly unlikely you're training with very good skill as close to failure as you think you are. And I just want to make that okay. That's fine. Like it's a it's a skill. I'm eight years into lifting and I still classify myself as an intermediate. Um, I still have some way to go. And again, that is fine. It doesn't mean I can't make progress. It doesn't mean that everything that we're doing is not helping us make progress. It does just mean though that there is still more genetic level, genetic potential. There's more genetic potential for us to reach, which to me is very, very, very exciting. Okay. So that was a very long way of saying The first thing we need to think of when we're thinking about improving your training performance in the one percenters is what are we trying to achieve? So if it's for muscle strength and or skill as as a basis to build your muscle and strength with the skill component there, we're thinking of the quality of each rep. So this means like is does every single rep look the same? Have you been able to standardize your movement so well that every single rep looks the same and you're able to repeat that? whilst training either two failure or a couple of reps or you know maximum of three reps short but I'd rather it be you know more like one or two uh yeah whilst maintaining amazing form because that's when you know we're specifically recruiting the muscle fibers that we want to recruit and we're applying that adequate stimulus so we're able to recruit uh as many or most or all of the those high threshold motor units that we need to recruit in order to apply the adequate stimulus to build muscle. All right, so if we've got that baseline of quality and intensity, which is what our standard is, we then need to think what is going to support the quality and intensity of each rep And so what I like to do is to say, well, it's going to be the things that I do, the way that I think, and the way that I live pre-session, during the session, and post the session. Okay, so the way I've really been thinking about this recently is like basically the way I live my life, (laughs) literally, dude, like I know that this might sound hectic, but it's true. The way I live is going to be supportive of my training. (laughs) So, and I know there are going to be things within our control and without our control. Okay. So just keep, bear with me. (laughs) So if I'm going to think about it like that, then the next step I go with is breaking these up. Okay. So let's just define our terms. We're looking at pre-session. I'm going to just call an hour before training. Now, I've not read this in a textbook. I've not heard anyone else discuss this. I'm making this up as a lifter and a coach with seven years of experience of coaching and eight years of experience of lifting. Let's just call the pre-session period the hour before training. So when I think we're starting to really think about the gym session, uh, if you're anything like me, you might be thinking about the gym session even two days before, <laughs> but that's that's probably for those of us who are very keen. Uh, then we have during the training session in and of itself, and then we have once the session has been completed, okay? And I'm going to call once a session has been completed as like once all of the training work has been done. All right, so that's our hour. 
So what I'm going to do now is go into pre-session, during the session, and post the session for what we can think of and what the areas are that we can look to to increase our training performance. So get your pens and papers ready. All right, pre-session. So we've got about an hour before. So I just want you to have a think about the most recent training session you did and what did you do the hour before? Literally go through it step by step by step. Okay. So where we want to look to for this is things like, I'm a huge one is nutrition and the next one is going to be mindset. Okay. So with nutrition, we're even thinking about hydration and making sure you have adequate hydration in order to be able to support your uh, output during the training session, making sure your muscle contractions are able to work effectively. Plus also carbohydrates for energy production during the session to make sure you're well fueled enough to perform the session. Potentially aids like caffeine. So we there is evidence to suggest that can, caffeine can improve training performance and particularly focus, but also like output. And on an aside... This doesn't specifically have to happen pre-session. I'll say it now because I'm talking about nutrition, but I'm also this could also be in the recovery phase. But you could also look to the supplement creatine monohydrate. I was actually on one of the webs, uh, nutrition, uh, a supplement website the other day, and I saw that they were selling like creatine pills in a different form. Don't do that. Just get the the form of the supplement that has the most research behind it, which is caffeine monohydrate. So the powder, caffeine monohydrate. Um, The other forms have don't have the evidence to support them like the monohydrate does. So please make sure. It's really interesting when I speak to people about different supplements and magnesium is one that comes to mind. There's lots of different forms of magnesium. Um, and there's lots of different dosages of magnesium. So yeah, it's really important to have a look at like the actual specific kind of supplement you're having and uh, the research behind that form of it. Okay. Because like with creatine, there are different types and they're being sold in different ways by different supplement companies, but you want creatine monohydrate. Okay. Um, So the research behind that shows you don't have to have it as it's not a pre-workout at all. We just need to keep our muscle stores saturated with the um, creatine. And so you can have it any time of the day, but typically a dose every, uh, I think it's three to five milligrams or so. I can't remember the specific dosages per kilo of body weight off by heart, Um, but something like three to five milligrams, yeah, three to five milligrams, three to five grams, sorry, three to five grams per day. Uh, is what's going to help keep your muscle store saturated. So that's what we want. So it, it is the benefits of creatine come with taking it literally every single day. And we're also going to want to think about our mindset. And this might be something that people don't think about, but, and this is where we're really getting into the one percenters, okay? So it's like, how do you feel about the session? How are you feeling in general? Are you... Is the, are the, is the emotional state that you're currently in supportive of a, of a really strong training session? If you've heard of anything, if you've heard of NLP, neuro linguistic programming, there are some concepts in that, but also in like cognitive behavioral therapy that really go to show our self talk will be, will impact our energy output, our capacity for doing work. And Typically, and you can try this to go under a heavy squat or a heavy leg press or something like that and be like, I can't do this. I'm shit. I'm a failure. This is too hard. I feel sick. I feel tired. Or try it with like, fuck, yeah, you can do this. You've got this. Um, I'm so excited to train. I can't wait to hit a PB. Really positive self-talk. It will impact your ability to for, for output. Okay, so it's your mindset is really important. And so pre-session, personally, I've noticed a big difference. If I listen to a podcast or an audio book where I'm thinking about work or something stressful, those first few minutes of the session are probably not going to be as good. And I might find it hard to get into the swing of things. So what I've started to do is really to say, you know what, I, I know I want to learn. I know I spent a lot of my time learning. I like learning, but this is not the time to learn, okay? My gym session is the time to again, support the quality and intensity of every single rep I'm performing. 
So to do that, I need, I know what works for me. And it's like a certain level of arousal is good too much for me. And I get like anxious and yuck. I feel the best way I can describe it is I feel yuck with too much. But this is where you need to get you to know yourself as a lifter and your level of arousal and what's going to work and not for you. And even for if you're a female, uh, where you're at in your menstrual cycle might impact the level of arousal that is going to suit you at any given time. So for example, you know, right close to just before ovulation or around ovulation or just a little bit after, you might be like, let's blast that techno music and go nuts. I'm just like really really here for it um, potentially some people a few days beforehand maybe you need some angry music um, and then maybe potentially just after you're just feeling like upbeat and like I don't know um, Lizzo vibes or whatever it is <laughs> you know so just have a think about that but arousal and mindset is really really important to know yourself as a lifter and to know like what's too much so for me at sometimes during the month I know if I'm going to have caffeine carbs and listen to like heavy techno I'm going to burn myself out within after the first exercise I'm just not going to have anything left in the tank so I need to really watch my levels of arousal so get to know yourself as a lifter and think about your mindset and what are you using to support yourself with that mindset piece I spoke about like listening to podcasts first music but have a think about like what works for you do you need music to g yourself into it do you need a specific kind of music to g yourself into it these things are all really really important okay so pre-session we're thinking that immediate hour beforehand um, it could even be things like the the types of clothing that you're wearing but yeah hydration carbs caffeine mindset and we'll add creatine to that list as well just to make sure you're taking it but again you might do that as part of your morning routine but you're training in the evening so you know i just wanted to make sure we've got creatine in there somewhere all right so that's some things to think about pre-session what are you doing in the hour before your training and does it support quality and intensity of each rep? Okay, from there, we're now going to dive into the actual session itself. So again, we're starting with mindset. I have trained before in gym environments and without a routine, so I was training at different times. And I noticed, I noticed that depending on the gym and then the time that I was training, my mindset would be greatly, greatly impacted by that. So there are a couple of situations which were really unfortunate where I wasn't good at telling people to go away and leave me alone. And there is a situation where there's this old man at this gym. I literally had to leave the gym because, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have it in me to say, I need you to just don't talk to me, please. Because it, it wasn't a situation of just someone being nice. I would be doing, you know, five reps of a bench press and he's still standing next to me talking to me. Um, and it was just, it just left me feeling very, very uncomfortable. And uh, yeah, I didn't know how to deal with the situation, but it really severely impacted my mindset. So like, these are all the things we're thinking about. It's going to impact my enjoyment of the session. It's going to impact how much energy I have to really push hard when someone is like trying to talk to you while you're working out. So do have a think of that. But your mindset during the session, again, what can you do to support a mindset that is going to allow you to push? Uh, whether it's music, whether it's self-talk, um, do you need a gym buddy? Whatever it is. Then we're thinking about your warm up. So, of course, just practically making sure you're dynamically warming up, both doing maybe a five minute mobility routine to just take your joints through the ranges of motion they're about to be exposed to. But then also for every single movement, I think a lot of women who are more like beginning to intermediate do this incorrectly is and I don't know I don't fucking know how people do it but like going straight into your working set um I don't think that that is going to be a great way to do things especially when you're lifting really heavy you're just pretty much asking for injury 
So we don't want to fatigue ourselves whilst we're warming up. That's important. We don't do so much work that we're fatiguing ourselves for our working sets. But two to three, what you would call feeder sets, ramping up to the work, sorry, ramping up to the load that you're about to lift is really smart. Um, With your feeder sets, you don't need to do like the amount of reps that you have listed. So for example, I'll just take my RDL. I do top a top set of, you know, like six, seven or so reps at 90 kilos. Um, my feeder sets will go, I just do a bit of the bar, a few, you know, maybe 10 to 12 reps with just the 20 kilo bar. Then I move into something like, you know, 40 kilos and I might do six. Um, and then I'll jump from 40 to 60 kilos and I might do four or five reps at 60 kilos. Again, I'm just managing fatigue. Um, from 60, I'll go to 80 and I might just do, two, I, yesterday I just did two reps at 80. Just got the feel for the weight of the bar. And then I'm going into my working sets for 90. And you can even just do one, you know, 10 to 15 kilos shy of what your top set is if you're doing fairly low loading top sets. But I just did, you know, what's that three or four feeder sets or uh, 20 kilo bar, 40 kilo, 60, one, one or two reps at 80. Yeah. So it was like four, I guess, feeder sets, um, up to that, working up to that 90 kilos. And that's just, I am just getting comfortable with the movement, making sure my body is anticipating heavy loads and getting ready to recruit all of those, um, muscle fibers that it needs to perform that movement, making sure I'm not going in cold. Um, my, my body wasn't expecting it. Okay. So uh, with that being said, moving from the warm up, something that you also might not have thought about, and especially if you're not the kind of person who has a training program, it's kind of one of those things you don't know how good it feels because you've never tried this before, but having a program will give you a level of confidence in the plan you have moving forward, but also confidence in your ability to execute. You're not wasting time and energy thinking about reps. You're not wasting your time and energy thinking about load. You're not wasting your time and energy thinking about, oh, you know, which movement should I do before which, and am I going to have the energy to do this? It's in your plan, and apart from the very first week of your program, you're going to just be on repeat executing again and again and again, which is going to build your your confidence in um, all of those lifts. You're going to know where you need to be in the gym. Again, it's just minimizing the bandwidth that you have to take to think of these things. You're not going to be fucking around with weights, wondering what weight should it, how heavy am I lifting? Blah, blah, blah. You spent all of those weeks trying to train to failure, so you know where you're going to be lifting for those particular movements. Okay, you're also going to be getting very good at your ability to execute each of those move, movements with a standardized form because every time you go into the gym you're practicing so the more consistent we are the more ability the more um, we get to practice each of these movements and we're going to get better and better over time you can't read it in a textbook you can't cheat this it's literally practicing and thinking about standardizing each rep over and over again with that comes the next point which was your skill level so your skill level and your ability to like I was saying at the very start exercise this standard range of motion for the movement that you've preset that you you're trying to achieve right to failure or just just shy of failure is going to require a high degree of skill and again, like I'm saying, this is actually still something I'm working on with eight years of experience because here and there I might cut a movement short just for a bit of an ego just to get that rep done, but I hadn't standardized the movement. So I'm not actually getting the progression that I want. I'm just cheating myself to put a, a better number in the book, right? In the log book, yeah? We don't want to do that, but that's okay. Like I'm not beating myself up for doing this at all. It's just I can identify it's an area for me to improve. But your skill level will improve over time. And again, like it's nothing you can cheat. You've just got to, no pun intended, put the reps in at the gym to be able to improve your skill. You're practicing, reviewing, refining. Practice, review, refine. Practice, review, refine. From there, we want to think about comfort. And this is clothing and accessories, right? So for example, just making sure you're in clothing that you're not thinking about. We don't want to have to think about our clothes. You know, my shorts are going up my bum crack or my... (laughs) my front crack. 
You know, my sports bra is lifting up. Yeah, is it falling down? Can people see my boobs? You know, did I shave my underarms? Who cares, quite frankly. But, you know, maybe that's something you're thinking about, you know. Um, my necklace is annoying. My hair clip's fucking in the way, right? We don't want to be thinking about this. Um, your shoes, what shoes are you lifting in? Are you performing your leg days in either really flat shoes or no shoes? You know, I think no shoes, the gyms don't like it. So maybe don't do that. Um, I actually love doing my leg days in my Nike blazers there. They feel way better than my dunks. So it's just something to think about too. Like even though dunks are flat, I, I feel the floor much better through the shoe in the Nike blazers. But something like, you know, maybe Converse could be good for you. Maybe like the barefoot shoes. Um, could be good for you. Vans are pretty good. Just think about what is helpful for you to train in. Um, but also things like wrist wraps, so you're not worried about your grip slipping or chalk or um, knee sleeves to keep your knees tracking comfortably and supported and warm. These are things that are all going to improve your ability to lift that weight. Quality and intensity. Quality and intensity. <laughs> Uh, the next one is your logbook. So this can help for a number of reasons. I know clients who have come to me who had been training a little bit, either maybe with someone else or just, you know, writing their own, well, not even writing their own programs, thinking about their sessions <laughs> before they go in. Um, they know with something to aim, aim for and being able to repeat the same movements over and over again. Uh, it actually helps them progress because if we don't have that, we, we're missing a form of accountability that we could have. So if you're just guessing, oh, I think I did this last week, blah, 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 blah. You're not going to fight to get an extra rep because you're like, I actually can't remember what I did. Uh, and so it's not going to give you that a level of accountability. You know, it can swing the other way where I've seen high achievers get really in their head, put too much pressure, and maybe then we go into ego lifting where we're missing reps, we're not standardizing reps. Um, so we just have to watch our own selves and just be very self-aware. Like, what are we trying to do? We're not trying to be perfect or reach a standard that we can't and end up feeling crappy about the whole thing. How, tell me how is feeling crappy going to get you the most out of your training sessions? It's not, it's never going to happen. And if this is you, it's your pathway to work on. It's like the thing you need to work on to start to talk to yourself with, in a more constructive manner. But yes, using a logbook for accountability is going to assist you. Again, once you're intermediate to advanced, it's unrealistic to expect progressions every week. And to be fair, if you're able to add on 5, 10 kilos every single week for this particular movement pattern, you're not an intermediate lifter or an advanced lifter because advanced lifters cannot do that. They've already, they've already like, what's the word? They've already... Um, they've already like rung out all of the skill progressions that they could have got, the strength adaptations that they could have got, right? So they're really going for those very, very small increments week to week, which might just be a rep or, you know, maybe 1.25 kilos or uh, 2.5 kilos, or we can go up in weight, but we have to bring the reps down. It's going to look very different. The progressions you make as you get more and more advanced are going to be smaller, uh, further and further apart, okay? And that's what it is. And if we're not, if we're jumping by heaps every week, there's obviously like we're getting better at the skill at the skill demand, you know, our motor skills are improving. Um, our ability to feel ourselves in space and know where we're, where our body is is improving. Our confidence in the lift is improving. Maybe we've um, just slightly changed our setup to improve our technique or, yeah, like even mindset and confidence, okay? But uh, it's important to have something to work towards and to try and beat, but also then just understanding that, the better we get, it's actually are actually going to come fewer and further between the wins. Okay, and that's okay. It's a good sign. It's a good sign you're pu- you've pushed yourself, and you've like I can't think of the word, but like I'm trying to think of like you know like having a t-shirt that you're wringing out of all of the water. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm seeing in my head when I'm thinking of the logbook and becoming more advanced. From there, we're also thinking about video recording. So video recording is going to be really good to help you see if you're standardizing every rep. Does every rep I do look the same? If not, okay, why not? Where am I going wrong? And we're wanting to think about 
especially for hypertrophy, but even more so, even even just say for strength, but especially for hypertrophy, we're trying to drive the stimulus into target our the the tissues we want to target. Okay, so it could be multiple. <laughs> but we're trying to drive stimulus in a particular area. Okay. So it's like, if you're trying to do a, a lap bias pull down, but you're super trappy and rhomboidy and, you know, shoulders, well, we're not driving the stimulus, most of the stimulus or all of the stimulus through our lats, right? We're, We're losing it. So if you can video yourself and watch your movement standardize, and it's like every rep looks the same and as you start to approach failure, say that one rep before failure, it still looks the same. It's just really, really slow, which is a great indicator that we have recruited all the motor units that we need to, all of the muscle fibers that we need to, and they're starting to fatigue. Like this is what we want. We're exhausting them. And then that last rep, it's like the the we're just short of the range perhaps because we've failed it. It was super slow. We've failed it, but the pathway of the range of motion was like spot on. It was just we couldn't complete the rep, so it's a failed rep. Yeah, that's really what we're looking for. And if you can record your sets and see that happening, you're going to start tapping into new levels of progression that you haven't seen before. Is this significantly uncomfortable? Yes. Are you going to have to fight past your brain saying, just stop, just stop, just stop? Yes. Okay, but I want you to keep in mind two things. It's quality and intensity. And when I need you to remember the caveat I used when I said intensity for this podcast, I'm also talking about the effort. Okay, so failure. Okay, so think about that every single rep. I need every single rep to look exactly the same. And I'm literally going to keep going until mechanically I break down. Not not when my mind says I am done, when I... I physically cannot move my my body through the rep anymore. And if you've never done this before, if you're hesitant, test it out in something very safe. A caveat for this is, do I recommend you do this on something like a barbell squat? No. Do I recommend you do this on something like a deadlift? Like not really, no. Um, even a bench press without spotters, no. Unfortunately, we've seen people kill themselves by doing this sort of stuff without the proper safety um safety mechanisms or people around them so no don't do it on those things but with something that is more safe like a machine-based movement or a cable or dumbbell isolated movement yes all right um so with that being said that was during our session with the one percenters and then we want to think of your post-session recovery Okay, so here what we're trying to do is we're trying to get ourselves into a parasympathetic state. So we've got our sympathetic state, we've got our parasympathetic state. It's like the the parasympathetic state is like the rest and digest, and the sympathetic is like fight and flight, right? So what we're trying to do is get ourselves as much as soon as we possibly can once the session is finished into our relaxed state. Is this always possible? Absolutely not. You might have kids, you might have to go straight back to work, you might have life stresses come into your brain. Um, But if we can, if you have the availability to, once you finish the session, even just lying down in like the recovery area for a second, taking some deep breaths, just being very mindful is going to do you, hold you in good stead. But when I talk about this post-session recovery, I'm talking about all of the hours left in the day um, that you have available to you. Okay, so I've got the pre-session down to one hour, but this post-session is like all of the other time you're not at the gym really. So we're trying to think parasympathetic state most of the time. If you have opportunity, if you have the opportunity available to you, how can you do something that's relaxing for yourself? And this will hold you in really good stead with managing your stress overall in terms of your whole life. So I know it is really hard for some people to do things that fill their cup and relax. And sometimes this is related to, you know, childhood trauma or conditioning or patterning or modeling. Um, or even like social status tied to being the go, go, go person, or maybe your identity is that it would feel like you're breaking down your whole identity to relax. You know, what does it mean about me if I'm not doing work, that I'm not a valuable human, right? So (laughs) this can be really deep stuff. But again, what are we trying to do? What am I trying to do with this podcast? Help you achieve a a really high level of training performance. How do we do that? We need to be as relaxed and free of stress as 
is within our capacity to do so. From there, it could be even something like manual therapy, so getting some massage or some um, you know, sports massage. Uh, this could even go into potentially you need physio or osteo appointments to keep you nice and in tuned. Um, have a think about manual therapies that that suit you and feel really good for you. Hell, even actual fucking talk therapy might be something that you need to do as well to help manage your stress. But here we're thinking like psychological and physical stress. How can we reduce that? Okay, and then we have your food intake. So of course, the calories and the micronutrients to support training. So people are not often often considering that for quality muscle contractions, we need our vitamins and minerals to support that. So if you're not sure, head into the free app Chronometer. You can chuck your food in and see where you are against the RDIs at at the basic uh, level. Or you can just go, you know, two fruits, five serves of veg. Unless you have any health reasons why you shouldn't, salting your food, sodium is really, really important for muscle contractions. Um, And it's often something that a lot of people are missing. But again, you need to consult your own doctor with your own nutritional needs. Um, And of course, females have so many common vitamin um, deficiencies. We've got things like iron, vitamin B, um, vitamin Ds. Again, just be careful with this. You don't want to be overdosing if you don't need something. So again, get your own blood work done and work off that. But food food timing potentially as well sometimes that's a you know a layer too many for some people and that's fair but having carbohydrates based a lot pre and post workout is going to help you a lot for your training sessions but food in general sleep and sleep quality it's not just hours of sleep it's sleep quality is really important so making sure you're waking up feeling refreshed i've coached people before who tell me oh yeah you know what i feel great on four or five hours sleep i just actually can't get more than that you're going to be an anomaly and it's probably highly unlikely. You've probably just a resilient human human who's gotten used to it. But it's one of those things where you don't know how good it can be on the other side of getting plenty of sleep. Sleep is really important for muscle recovery. Um, it's really important to learn motor skills as well. So sleep is very important for um, the, the learning of mo- new movement patterns, something that people don't think about. But you getting quality sleep and enough sleep is going to solidify the movement patterns that you practice during the day. Okay, again, your mindset, just limiting psychological stress, becoming a more resilient and gritty human, um, being able to think through what you're doing in the gym constructively, not beating yourself up over things, but just taking away potential lessons, giving yourself the grace that you're human and that you're learning and that the learning does, doesn't stop. So you hear me talk about being an intermediate, not an advanced lifter. You know, I could be like, oh, fuck, I'm a coach and, you know, I should be able to, I should be able to be an advanced lifter by now. None of that enters my brain because I'm at where I'm at. I'm just meeting myself where I'm at. I'm here. Um, I'm learning, I'm consistently getting better. And that's, I know that that mindset is going to be so much more beneficial for me than, than thinking that I, you know, should be, who says I should be further along, right? It's just arbitrary. Then we're looking at routines. So that's something that I've done this year that has really, really helped me, which has just reduced my decision making and just gone, you know, I'm going to get to the gym six days a week, first thing in the morning. It just happens. There's no, oh, should I do it this day or that day or this time or that time? It doesn't help me get in. I just have a routine and I do all those things. And same with my foods, right? I don't have um, hard meal times, but I have types of foods I typically eat. Again, reducing decision fatigue. It's making sure I'm getting all of my nutrients in to support my my training. Uh, We have accountability and support. So those two things are really important. Um, I think for a lot of people, someone that we can talk to about our training, someone that we can ask questions, someone that we can seek for help. Um, But also there is that accountability. Now we're adults, really, we're always choosing to be accountable to someone else. But it can be it can be like a little bit of a, a check and balance, right? Just to have that thought process, oh, I've got to check in. So, you know, I really want to do the, these important things. And I think that that's been something really important for me. Even as a coach myself, I still find it really useful. Honestly, my coach hardly talks to me. Like we hardly talk. We pretty much never talk. I do my check-in. He sends me two minutes video back and that's it. But... <laughs> Um, just having that and then just knowing I've got it if I need it is, is what I need, right? Because here and there, there are times where I might 
message and ask something a little bit more or ask for a little bit more information in a check-in and it's there if I need it. Plus we've got my coach has been with me for over six years now. We know my body inside out, upside down. And I love having someone who knows me just as well as I know myself. The final one here is celebration. <laughs> celebration, congratulating yourself for amazing performance, treating yourself for consistency, treating yourself for the effort regardless of the outcome. And actually to wrap that up, <laughs> it's a really good time to talk about the Glam Body Photo Shoot, which is happening on the 18th of November in Springvale in Melbourne. And this is an outlet for those of you who are putting in all of this effort, but don't necessarily want to compete or have something else to celebrate all of your hard work. And this is what the Glam Body Shoot is all about. You don't need to be in a deficit to undertake the photo shoot you very well can be if you would like to but this is going to be a gym studio based shoot uh, so we'll be training we'll be getting the photographer to take photos of us doing some lifts getting some really really cool shots to celebrate the effort and the hard work so I know what we're doing this for overall is, you know, we like the look of it. We like feeling strong. We like all of the benefits. And again, if we zoom out, a lot of us are doing this to help us with our uh, long-term health and fitness goals. But also I think it's really love to, lovely to have an outlet to be able to celebrate that for ourselves. So if that is something you're interested in, um, and you're listening to this before the 18th of August, then shoot me through a DM and we can have a chat if the photo shoot is something that is right for you. It comes with my coaching service. So with that being said, if you got anything out of this episode, which I hope you did, please, please, please shoot me through a message and let me know what you thought. Please give the podcast a review. Uh, I would really, really appreciate that if you could. And of course, tag me and share this one on your stories. I'll speak to you guys next week.